Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Russia's hybrid war strategy, a little bit about where it comes from, and a little bit about what to do about it. And a lot of what I'm going to say comes from actual what R Russian leaders have said or written about uh, the strategy and, and their goals. So Russian officials argue that color revolutions are a new form of warfare, essentially, that has been invented by Western governments uh, seeking to replace um, independent national governments with ones that are controlled by the West. Uh, and they see this as part of a global strategy to force uh, foreign values um, and, and uh, kind of US hegemony on countries that would otherwise uh, have been refusing to accept it. So while the West considers color revolutions to be uh, expressions of peaceful opposition to authoritarian regimes, uh, Russian officials argue that really uh, military force, uh, Western military force, is, that, is an integral part of, of color revolutions. Uh, so in their view, uh, Western governments use pre peaceful protests to engineer regime change. Uh, uh, and then if protest proves insufficient, a military force can then be used uh, uh, afterwards to, to, to ensure that regime change does occur. And, that, and the, 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 the extent of, of this military force that the West uh, is ex, uh, assumed to use goes uh, all the way from just external pressure uh, to, to prevent the use of force to, uh, by the legitimate government to restore order, all the way to providing military uh, uh, and economic assistance to, to rebel forces. And then if that's not sufficient, then uh, Western states can organize a military operation uh, to allow the rebels uh, to take power. And, and the advantage of this method, uh, as, as Russian uh, leaders describe it, is that it uh, requires a com relatively, a comparatively low expenditure of resources uh, to achieve the goals. Uh, and, then the, uh, and, and so and then the, there's, uh, as far as uh, where it's been used, Russian leaders see that over the last years, 15 years, the, this, been used everywhere from Serbia and then Libya, uh, Syria, and now in Ukraine. But the perception all along is, and especially since the um, uh, election-related protests in 2011-2012 uh, in Russia, is that Russia is one of the main targets, uh, 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 if not now, then later. So Russia's, uh, this has led Russia to develop, seek to develop a new uh, national security strategy in uh, response that combines uh, political and military actions. Uh, I'm going to talk about the political side very briefly. Uh, one part is uh, alliances with uh, other authoritarian regimes uh, that are also worried about popular uprisings uh, weakening their hold on power. So uh, particularly Middle East and Asia, uh, parts of Latin America. Uh, and then the second part of the, the second political side is the uh, trying to damage the unity of the Western alliance. And part of that is uh, uh, these alliances with, uh, with right-wing parties in Europe uh, uh, based on shared opposition to EU expansion, support for traditional values, and so forth. Also, uh, alliances with the Christian right in the United States, uh, as, uh, in some cases. And I can talk more about that if, if people are interested in the Q&A. Uh, but then there's the military side. Uh, so, and that includes, first of all, assistance to authoritarian regimes uh, uh, mil military, military assistance, I mean. Uh, uh, and, then, and then also uh, the kind of uh, public support for actions against protesters uh, by you know, using force against, against them. Uh, that then, as part of the, an information warfare campaign, are conflated, the protesters are conflated with terrorists or radicals uh, in the rhetoric. If that's not enough, then Russia provides uh, uh, direct support to anti-Western uh, forces. Uh, and so we see that with simulation of popular uprisings, support for insurgents, uh, threat of direct military force uh, to protect co-ethnics, uh, Russians abroad, and so forth. Uh, and claims to protect Russians living abroad are particularly important because they can really be used as an excuse for intervention most anywhere in the former Soviet Union, given the large number of Russians living uh, uh, in, the, in Eurasia, uh, 
and can also become a self-fulfilling prophecy where the governments of the former Soviet states come to distrust their ethnic Russian populations as kind of a you know, fear of a fifth column sort of thing. And that leads to, potentially leads to discrimination that uh, creates the conditions for Russian intervention uh, down the road. Uh, so the, the, this controlled chaos strategy that uh, uh, Russia has has three stages. The first is, uh, so when, once we get to the active uh, part of the, of, the, of, the, of the strategy, first is uh, destabilizing the country and inspiring domestic conflict. So creating uh, puppet state structures, flooding the region with weapons, uh, using for foreign mercenaries to destroy uh, regional infrastructure and harass the local population. Uh, second part uh, is, uh, involves uh, causing economic damage and state collapse. And so you can see, have aspects of an economic blockade, blockade block, uh, blocking certain, certain kinds of exports to Russia, that sort of thing, uh, blocking the functioning of the local state in terms of law enforcement, social welfare, occupying buildings, uh, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, and, and those things together then create a refugee crisis in many uh, cases. Uh, and then the third part is Russia sta steps in as a savior, uh, replacing the local political leadership, uh, introducing uh, potentially Russian peacekeeping forces, and you know, potentially creating a, a frozen conflict, uh, de facto state kind of, kind of territory. So uh, how does this all work in Ukraine? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, because I think the, the basic outlines are probably familiar to everybody in this room. But, uh, but Russian actions in Ukraine were really based on this strategy uh, and closely paralleled how Russian leaders uh, saw the U.S. colored revolution strategy as working, so kind of a, a mirror imaging in a way. Uh, and they started by providing Yanukovych just with advice on how to deal with protesters uh, and encouraging repression, providing you know, quid, quid pro quo economic assistance, that sort of thing. Uh, and when that wasn't enough to keep Yanukovych in power in, uh, come February, uh, there were immediate actions taken to weaken the new government before it really had time to, to consolidate authority. So we saw counter-protests in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Uh, now, I'm not, uh, you know, I know that, uh, I, I'm certainly not going to argue that these were all Russia-inspired. There was, uh, as Sergei has po pointed out, there's a strong domestic component to this. But, uh, but the two work together. They, they help, uh, there, there's a, an element where Russia helps to promote the uh, domestic uh, discontent. Uh, there's, there was obviously the mass media campaign against uh, the so-called uh, uh, fascist junta uh, in Ukraine. Uh, threats to uh, thre uh, uh, there were threats of force or military Russian military exercises on the border, uh, uh, and statements that Russia had to, uh, the right to protect co-ethnics abroad, all culminating in the c covert military action in Crimea, and then moving on to eastern Ukraine. Again, a similar kind of escalation uh, over time. First military assistance, then shelling from Russian territory, uh, and, then a, and then a limited contingent of troops uh, that was uh, entered into uh, eastern Ukraine and really changed the, uh, the dynamics of the conflict. Well, so at every point when the, when the amount of assistance that was being provided seemed to be insufficient, there was an escalation uh, to a higher level. And all of this was designed, again, to prevent uh, the anti-Russian gover uh, government in Ukraine from consolidating and acting in ways that uh, and uh, that were uh, against against Ru Russian interests, and all again uh, in a way kind of designed in a way to the, these actions were designed in a way that appeared to really deliberately mirror perceived U.S. actions uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere. So just to conclude with a, just a few lessons learned. Uh, for, for Ukraine, but also more generally for the region. Uh, first of all, you really need to maintain, if you're a country that, uh, on Russia's border, you need to maintain a credible military force for defensive purposes. Uh, throughout Ukraine's uh, post-Soviet independence, uh, the government consistently underfunded the military, assuming that the country didn't really uh, face any serious security threats. Uh, and uh, in addition, what funding there was was diverted through various corrupt practices. Uh, and as a result, the U Ukrainian military was really unable to maintain, uh, uh, equip, or train its forces. Uh, and while some analysts have blamed the Yanukovych government for deliber de deliberately undermining the military, uh, I would argue that the situation was actually 
uh, comparably similar under Yushchenko and previous governments. This is not a Yanukovych problem. This is a, a Ukrainian government problem po you know, throughout the, the post-Soviet uh, period. Uh, second uh, uh, lesson learned, that steps to eliminate conscription that Ukraine undertook in recent years uh, had uh, really a negative effect on uh, military morale and cohesiveness. I mean, it goes a lot, there was already, morale was pretty low because of the uh, reasons I just mentioned, but this had a, a further undermining effect. Uh, because uh, in order to minimize expenses, professional uh, contract soldiers were uh, usually stationed near their places of origin. And so uh, that meant that when the conflict in Crimea took play when uh, the uh, in, uh, Russian forces intervened in Crimea, a disproportionate number of Ukrainian military personnel in Crimea displayed uh, pro-Russian uh, sympathies. Disproportionate by overall Ukraine standards, not by Crimea standards. So uh, uh, other countries with territorial political divisions, uh, this is the lesson part, uh, should ensure that their military forces are well integrated uh, and with and uh, uh, to, to the extent possible, rotate military for, uh, personnel from region to region every few years to to avoid these kind of uh, regional sympathies forming. Uh, and the final final thing I'll say uh, is that potential target states need to take measures uh, to ensure that their minority populations are well integrated into their political systems. Uh, and this uh, means. Uh, political education efforts to among vulnerable populations uh, that can make them less vulnerable to um, Russian information warfare tactics. So we see now uh, uh, Latvia, for example, starting a Russian language uh, television and med uh, media uh, presence to try to counter so that people who, who primarily get their information in the Russian language don't, uh, aren't just monopolized by coverage from Moscow, but can get alternative sources of information. And so these steps to, to, that could lead to a better integration of minorities will close potential opportunities that Russia could use to exploit uh, uh, and create instability. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mr.